Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless. Does God love me? Does God love me? Yes, he loves you. Accept it. Now, do you love him? What would you do for him? At some point, we're all going to be alone there, you know? You're hearing a passion in my heart. Oh, he's angry. Jim Caviez is angry. Whoa, wow, look at him. That's the devil talking to you. There are two masters here. And many Catholics are listening to the wrong one. Yes. I'm telling you right now. Hi, it's another video compilation on Armor of God, and thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. Well, this video is going to be rather special because we have just hit 40,000 subscribers for this channel, and so I'd like to make a special compilation in light of that. The 10 Shocking Truths Revealed by Exorcists. I know the title is a little bit sensationalized, but some of the things shared by these exorcists are truly shocking. Anyway, now buckle up and let's start with the first on the list. Number one on the list is what Father Chad Ripperter said about Joanne Kathleen Rawling, who is the author of the hugely popular book series Harry Potter, and he said that the author went to a witch school. J.K. Rawlings went to witch school before she wrote the books. The spells in the books are actual spells. There, I had a case of possession. I wasn't the one to liberate them. I was just one of the, uh, I started the case, but I had to pass it to someone else because I had to move to another location of a person who was possessed by five demons who claimed that they were the demons that inspired J.K. Rawlings to write Harry Potter. Tolkien had magic. I mean, is it just because of magic? No, it's not just because of the magic. It's, it's the whole thing. But in Tolkien, the magic was a literary device. It wasn't something in which the person, you know, when he heard, you know, he heard Gandalf saying the magic, oh, I want to be God, Gandalf and do these magic things. That's not what you, you just didn't have that. It was just recognized that in this case, a certain thing beyond the natural means was necessary in order to bring something about. Whereas in the J.K. Rawlings thing, it's so imbued and it makes it look so glorious and all those things. It's really enticing. And that's another reason why I tell people don't let your kids read it. Number two is what Father Carlos Martin said during a recent lecture, that while we are still in our mother's womb, we don't belong to our parents or God, but instead we belong to the devil. When you were conceived inside your mother's womb, when you began to exist inside your mother, to whom did you belong? Right, so there, there were three people involved in your making, right? Your mother and your father, each provided the biological components for you, for your existence. At the moment that those biological components were just right, God infused a soul. Three involved that you're making. In that moment, to whom did you belong? You belong to the devil. And this is the legacy and the inheritance given to you by your first father, Adam. It's because of the sin of Adam that this is the case, right? And, and I say the sin of Adam because it was his sin. The covenant was made with Adam, not with Eve. When Eve ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Eden, what happened after that? Nothing happened. Nothing. Go read Genesis chapter 3. Nothing happened. When Adam ate of the fruit, what happened? All hell broke loose. The covenant was made with Adam, not with Eve. That is why the Messiah had to be a male. He had to be a new Adam. And just as Eve prepared the sin right, for Adam, she handed the fruit to Adam. Now, uh, you men, don't, don't start beating up women over that because Adam was given the charge to look over the garden, right, to guard it and protect it. So where was he when Eve was dialoguing with the serpent? He was standing right next to her and he said nothing. He failed in his duty. That, that paved the way for the sin. The first thing Eve did wrong is she started talking with the sin. You never talk to the devil, ever. Ever. You never talk to the unknown. There are these foolish shows on, ghost hunting shows, paranormal shows. They start speaking into the dark. Who are you? We're here. We're, 
Are you friendly? To talk to the unknown is to grant it a relationship with you. Is that really what you want to do? I never converse with evil. In an exorcism, I issue commands. I never answer questions. I never ask him how he's doing. Number three is what Father Vincent Lampert shared during a live stream with our Catholic brother William Albrecht, and that is the devil cannot use the name Lucifer anymore because to use the name Lucifer is to acknowledge God who created him. You know, when I, I, well, I let me tell you this one. When I left Rome, the priest that trained me, I asked him, I said, what's the most difficult case of exorcism you've ever dealt with? And he told me that he worked with a person for five years who was dealing with demonic possession and the demon would not reveal itself and whatever. So he finally said, when the demon manifested, is your name Lucifer? And he said the response he got back was rather interesting. He said the demon told him, I used to be known by that name, but no longer. And he found it interesting that the devil can no longer use the name Lucifer because to use the name Lucifer is to acknowledge the giver of the name. And because Satan has now rejected God, he can no longer use the name that God had given him. Number four. The late Father Amorth claimed that Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin were possessed by the devil. In his own words, and I quote, I am convinced that Hitler was possessed by the devil. If one thinks of what was committed by people like Stalin or Hitler, certainly they were possessed by the devil. This is seen in their actions, in their behavior, and in the horrors they committed. And even Pope Benedict said this of the matter. There are reliable reports by eyewitnesses that suggest he had some kind of demonic encounters. Hitler would say while trembling, he was there again, and other such things. We cannot get to the bottom of it. I believe one can see that he was taken into the demonic world in some profound way, by the way in which he was able to wield power and by the terror, the harm, that his power inflicted. On the one hand, Hitler was a demonic figure. One only need read the history of the German generals who time and again made up their minds, just for once to tell into his face what they really thought, and who were then yet again so overcome by his power of fascination that they did not dare to. But then when you look at him from up close, the same person who has a demonic fascination about him is really just a quite banal hoodlum. Number 5. Hell is a Mercy to Demons by Monsignor Stephen Rossetti. Some time ago I released a video where Monsignor Rossetti asked the demons whether Jesus still loves them, and the demons replied yes. And some of you argue that it is impossible for Jesus to still love them because demons are damned to hell. They rejected God. But again, I'll look at it this way. These fallen angels are still God's creation. And remember, it's not God who stopped loving them. It's the demons who refuse to accept God's love to be in his presence. One of the major obstacles is always the reality of suffering and evil. How can God allow this? Perhaps one of the greatest is the existence of hell. People say, well, how can God send anyone to hell? Something that John Paul too, uh, Pope John Paul told us. He said, God really doesn't send anyone to hell. He said, people choose it. But even the existence of hell, we can still struggle with it. Well, how can, how can God allow this? I began to realize in my ministry as an exorcist that hell really is shocking but true, really a mercy. Everything that God does is loving and merciful, even though it might not seem it at the time. I know it's in exorcisms that when we hold up anything holy, the demons go nuts. They, they, you hold up a crucifix, ecce, crucem domini, fut et parte adverse, they start screaming. If something small like that could cause them an immense amount of suffering, imagine what it'd be like for the demons to be in the presence of God. It would be a torture beyond belief. They couldn't stand it. So hell is a place, sadly, uh, away from the Lord, who they rejected, and were they in God's presence, it would be a suffering beyond, beyond anything. So as crazy as it sounds, for them, hell really is uh, a, a mercy. Number six, Annalise Michelle was cursed when she was still in her mother's womb by her own grandmother. This is according to Father Joseph Iannuzzi. There are four types, I would say. Two are innocent, two are not. Be deliberate or indeliberate. Um, the two innocent those that have been the subject of a curse in the womb of their mother, and there are more than you can imagine. 
there was a famous film called The Exorcism of Emily Rose that was in the film about 90% accurate. It's a true story of a woman named Annalisa Michel from Germany, Bavaria, I think, Bavaria. And she was afflicted from the time she was in her mother's womb by the curse of her grandmother. We didn't get along very well with the mother. And these symptoms of curse, being cursed, did not manifest themselves until her college years. So they were dormant. Number seven, the devil can send texts. Now some of you called this claim a complete lie and went on saying what other lies you want us to believe. Now stop for a moment and think. These fallen angels, they are far smarter than us. They live longer than us and just think for a moment. You really think these ancient beings can't take advantage of cell phones to mislead us? Number eight, the so-called seer who is best known for his book, The Prophecies, a collection of 942 prophecies allegedly predicting future events. According to Father Ripperger, Nostradamus was able to supposedly predict future events with the help of demons. Now, of course, demons can't see the future, but they make good guesses based on their observations. When they were created, God infused in them the totality of all of the natures and all the concepts of everything that would ever exist. So, boom, all at once they have this perfect comprehension of everything. So all they need to do to know what a tree is, is just look, think of a tree and boom, they instantaneously acknowledge, uh, exhaust to the degree that their intellect can what a tree is. This is true about human beings. All they have to do is think of what a human being is. They know every single faculty. They know exactly how it works. They know how DNA works. They know how disposition works, the DNA connected to the disposition. They actually know how our appetites and emotions work. They know how the interrelations of the various faculties. They also know um, just by looking at um, the, uh, they also know the various kinds of causes and things perfectly, so they know causes. This is how Nostradamus was able to use divination or sorcery in order to, to figure out a large of the amount of stuff that was actually going to happen because of the fact that the, the demons can look at the state of things and then f they know perfect the nature of causes and so they know where the things, these things are headed. Number nine, demons suffer more during exorcisms than in hell. This is what the demons told Father Amor during an exorcism session. To put it simply, the reason they suffer more during exorcisms is because these exorcists present a lot of holy stuff on them. So that's the simplest way to put it. The exorcists will be reading from scriptures, present holy relics, holy water, and so on. And finally, number 10, hell was made by demons. According to Monsignor Rossetti, demons want to hang on to their possessed people. Time and again during an exorcism they whine and say they don't want to leave, which often reminds Monsignor Rossetti of the demon's legion in the Bible who begged Jesus, as he was exorcising them, to go into the swine. Apparently, they don't want to go back to hell. But hell is the place of their own making. There is a well-known line among exorcists uttered by a demon during an exorcism. The priest was commanding the demons to go back to hell, the place which he said that God made for them. And the demon replied, You stupid priest! God didn't make hell. He would never have thought of such a place. We made it. This is why hell is so horrible. It was made by demons. Well, then I hope this compilation is good. And some of the things here I have shared in past videos, but I've also added a few new things into the compilation. Before that, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Julia, who's not a Catholic, but she's always here supporting this channel, watching and listening, and like I said many times in the past, I've grown as a person and to be more careful when it comes to the choice of words and images used for visual aids as I explain these things not only to the Catholics, but to the Protestants and non-believers as well. All of the content for this channel is shared through the lens of a Catholic, but still I really do hope that our Protestant brothers and sisters will find these contents helpful for them in their spiritual warfare. Fair. I gotta tell you, earlier on in my life, when I was dancing, I probably was a curse to my family. I felt like that. I was going down a dark road. I turned my life around. And so, I don't know, you probably talk to them today and they might be like, no, she's not really that much of a blessing. But I am conscientiously choosing to change the way that I do life and deciding to be a blessing wherever I am. Anyway, for those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation down in the description box below. And as we're doing this full time now, I must admit that this is really a fulfilling journey of learning, humility, discovery, and I've learned so much from putting things together in this channel on the subject of spiritual warfare. And again, thank you so much and until the next one,
Stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you. Does God love me? Does God love me? Yes, he loves you. Accept it. Now, do you love him? What would you do for him? At some point, we're all going to be alone there, you know? You're hearing a passion in my heart. Oh, he's angry. Jim Caviezel is angry. Whoa, wow, look at him. That's the devil talking to you. There are two masters here. And many Catholics are listening to the wrong one. Yes. I'm telling you right now. And why aren't the bishops? Why aren't the priests stepping forward? Now, the holy ones do. And by God, they're amazing. Holy saints. But we got to stop living in the middle. We got to stop taking a break today at McDonald's or whatever you want to call it. That altar table is an altar table of sacrifice. It's not a dinner table where you have bread and wine. Stop making it look like we're eating pieces of bread and drinking wine. We're not Protestant. We're Roman Catholic. We're the tip of the spear. Pope John Paul said, Every generation of Americans needs to know that freedom exists not to do what you like, but having the right to do what you ought. That's the freedom I wish for you, for us. Freedom from sin, freedom from our weaknesses, freedom from the slavery that sin makes out of all of us. That is the freedom that is worth dying for.